Thanks, right, we're ready to go. All right, Stephen, go ahead. So my question has to pertain more to the theological aspects of, uh, I guess, the problem of evil that mm -hmm. sometimes atheists will question Christians on. And for those like, who prescribe to like, a Calvinistic type of idea of how God preordains and predestines not only um, who we are, but also our will and our thoughts and everything. So I guess how, as Christians, do we answer that if they were to? And like, I guess what's um, scriptural support and evidence to answer that as well? Okay, predestination, free will. is a good. That's a good question. Unfortunately, we're not predestined to talk about that here tonight. <laughs> All right? I've just been told that we can't talk about that tonight. No. I think wherever... Uh, God says, believe or trust in me, that implies you can do it. And of course, the scriptures say that God wants all to be saved. Well, if he wants all to be saved and God is completely in control in the sense that we don't have free will, he can zap all of us and just make us believe, then why isn't everybody saved? If he wants all to believe and all to be saved, but not all are saved, it must be that we have some say in the matter too. And I think it's true that none of us would seek God unless he sought us first, right? God's Holy Spirit goes to all people, but only some respond to it. Now you say, how can we be free, free and God sovereign at the same time? Let me give you an illustration. Let's say you love football, which you do. And uh, you love NFL football, so you have NFL Sunday ticket. But you're away one Sunday, and you can't watch any of the games. And so... You decide that you're going to record them all, and when you get home that night, you're going to watch your favorite team. But on your way home, your friend texts you the scores, and you go, man, I do not want to know the scores. But you go home, and you elect to watch the game anyway. Now, you already know what's going to happen, right? But does that mean that because you know what's going to happen, the players on the field don't have free will? No, they still have free will, right? Even though you know what's going to happen. Well, the same is true with God. God's outside of time. He can see the end from the beginning. He knows what we're going to do before we do it, but that doesn't mean we don't have free will. We st we're still freely doing what we're doing. And when God elected to create this universe as opposed to any other universe, he elected the outcome. He knew how we would, that you, know, you would believe and maybe Richard Dawkins wouldn't. But you're believing and Richard Dawkins is not trusting in Christ based on your own free will. His Holy Spirit went to you and Richard Dawkins, and Richard Dawkins said no, and you said yes. So we're chosen, but we're also free. In fact, my co-author, Norman Geiser, wrote a book called Chosen But Free. And if you really want to get into it, I recommend you get that book. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Hey, Steve. Oh, you already have the book. I'm not giving it. <laughs> Head fake. All right. Who's up next? And by the way, you don't have to wait. You can just kind of line up behind him. That would be just fine. I've got a question. Um, Come on over here, sir, if you would. Yes, sir, what's your name? My name's Javier. Javier, how are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. All right, great. I'm here for our wife, Rachel. Over there. Hey, Rachel, how I, are you? I got a question for you on the... Come in a little closer to the mic, if I you I got will. a question for you on the analogy that you gave on, like, your wife or girlfriend. Uh-huh. Um, it was my wife. Right. Okay. So, can you repeat that so they could... Um, hear the question again or the you're talking analogy. about belief that belief in that analogy where I said that I got evidence that my wife would be a good wife yes I got evidence that she would be a good wife that was intellectual but all the evidence in the world didn't make her my wife I had to take a step of trust in her to ask her to be my wife right um, well my question is like have you ever seen the show catfish no do you know what I'm sure everybody what is that show catfish. on um uh, you know what? I've watched it a couple times. It's on MTV. It's basically, uh, Catfish is a show basically where someone uh, pretends to be someone else on the internet. Uh huh. So, see, my thing is, is with God, okay, if God exists, because you keep saying he's outside of time. Right. I, I, I don't know what that means when you say God exists out, 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 outside of time. Well, let me ask you this question. The laws of logic. Are they inside of time, or are they transcendent? Well, your video said that... What did your video say? That God cannot, what, break the laws of logic? God's nature establishes the laws of logic. So, well, yes. How do you know that? Well, because he is the ground of everything that exists. But how do you know that? Well, now you're asking an epistemological question. Epistemology, as you know, has to do with how you know 
ontology has to deal with that something exists. Yeah. So if these laws exist, but, they must come from the law okay. here. If God is, if, if I gave you a million dollars, okay, mm -hmm. you have three kids, I give you a million dollars, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to give you this million bucks for zero seconds. Does that mean that you have it? Well, no, because that's a contradiction. You haven't given it to me if it's for zero right. seconds. Right, so if God is outside of space and time, what is that? What oh, that well, he can, he can, he can, his acts can intervene into space time, space time, but he personally is not in space time because he's not a spatial being. How do you know that? How can you prove that to us that this God is outside well, of space Well, okay, time? Uh, let me give you one argument. The evidence shows that space, matter, and time had a beginning. Even atheists admit this. Even now, walking, say, space, matter, and time had a beginning. In other words, the universe had a beginning. Okay. okay. Atheists aren't even arguing over that now. They're trying to come up with another explanation other than God. But if space, matter, and time had a beginning, whatever created space, matter, and time can't be in space, matter, and time. So in what other created words, God? Well, that's a good question. Let me, let me get there. And who created God? If... Let, me, let me get okay. there. Let me, let me finish this, okay? okay? Because I don't have time. No. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> If space, matter, and time had a beginning, whatever created space, matter, and time can't be made of space, matter, and time. In other words, the being must transcend space, matter, and time. But, and if, let me finish. Yeah, but this is something that you're, this is a, a claim. This is a deduction from the evidence. If space, matter, and time had a beginning, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. Now, if you're timeless. How can you prove that claim? It's a deduction from there? the evidence. Were you there? Well, no, but nobody was there at the creation of the universe, but that doesn't mean we don't have theories about how it happened. Right. Right. But then you... You, you weren't there when George Washington was on the earth either, but you right. believe in George Washington. But George Washington, it doesn't matter if I believe in George Washington. You're absolutely right. Because George Washington doesn't say to me that if you don't believe in me, you go to hell. That's exactly that's, right. That's a big difference. Well, no, there's a big implication right. here. I agree with you, Javier. There's a big implication However, regardless of the implications, how you know something is irrelevant of the implications, right? If space, matter, and time had a beginning, the logic, the implication, the logical implication of that is whatever created the universe is timeless. Now, if you're timeless, do you have a beginning? Well, you would have to, that's a claim that you would have to prove. But it's a deduction from the evidence, okay? Whatever created time, can, can, the, can the being that created time be made of time? Well, we don't know that. We weren't there, right? If wood didn't exist and wood was created, could the being that created wood be made of wood? If wood, say that again? If wood did not exist and suddenly it did exist, could the being that made wood be made of wood? No. 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 That's what we're saying here. If time had a beginning, if time didn't exist and then suddenly did exist, Whatever created time can't be in time, must transcend time. Now, there are some people, uh, very re reputable Christian theologians like William Lane Craig, who will say once God creates space-time, he enters space-time. I don't think that's right, but mm -hmm. I totally respect Craig's view. I think God still transcends time, but can intervene in space-time. Well, going back to this, you know, the, the catfish analogy, where is this guy? Like... For me to meet my wife or mm -hmm. anybody, I mean, we have models of human beings. Mm -hmm. Where is this model of God? Okay, you're asking a where question about a being that's not a where being. Yeah, but he interacts, right? He dips his hand. He yes. answers prayer. He heals people. Right. Right? Right. So he should, uh, this being should leave remnants of themselves. You're somewhere. absolutely right. That's right. how we know God exists. We know God by his effects. We don't see God directly. That's if it's true. Yes. Because well, people, can, people can be mistaken, right? Sure people can be mistaken. Right. But like we know there's a creator when we reason from the effect of creation back to a creator. We know there's a moral law giver when we reason from the moral law back to a moral law giver. Okay? We're reasoning from effect to cause. If, if you were to go up on Mars right now and find a computer... Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know who put it there, right? But you would know there had to be an intelligent being that put it there, even if well, you never saw that's, him. That's because we have models of people making computers. We have human beings that build computers, and we have that as a model. And what I'm saying is, where is this God, this model? Where is he? Okay. Where is he? At, at the end of the day, you're asking a where question about a non-where well, being. But, like, where are the laws of logic? Well... Where... 
Where, no, where no. is the justice molecule? Well, the, the laws of logic are something that we as human beings, it's a concept that we, it, it's a label that we give it, a concept that we build to, to help ourselves through society, through, through life. All right, let me ask you a question about that. So you're saying that human minds create the laws of logic? Not that we create them. Um, uh, it's a concept that we have. It is a concept, but do they exist independent of our minds? Well, uh, I mean, a rock is still a rock if there's no human beings to, to say that it's a rock or to think it. That's true. Right? Yes. So these so, laws exist. Even if there were no human beings, these laws of logic would exist. Yes. I agree with you. Now, the question is, where do those laws come from? They well, come from lawgivers. They come from a reason, logos, yes. logic. But you're using the word laws. It's so that the, the word law is is a word that a label that we give it. I mean. But what if it? A, what if this label actually communicates the truth? It, it's not just a label. What if it's the truth to say that all laws come from lawgivers? That all laws come from lawgivers. Lawgivers. Well, I think it's we as human beings uh, get together and we label these things. We do label them, but it's, we, we could have called it something else. Right. But, but does it correspond to reality to say that if there's a law, there must be a lawgiver? If there was a law, well. Do you know any law that exists that doesn't come from a lawgiver? The laws of logic. That's what I'm saying. They're, they must come from a lawgiver then, because every other law we know about comes from a lawgiver. Well, we don't know that. Well, but, uh, this is just something that we as human beings... But Javier, you're, you're making a claim, and you need evidence for your claim as much as I need evidence for my claim, right? So the question is, what evidence do you have that the laws of logic have no grounding? Where do they come from? Well, we could just say we don't know. Well, you could say that, or you could take an inference to the best explanation to say that if but every law not, has a lawgiver, but then the laws the of logic must have a lawgiver. You say it's the best explanation. Well, you don't yeah. have to accept it. You're right. Yeah, you say But it. let me ask you a question. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Well, it depends on what your definition of Christianity is, because there's, there's different... There's different um, all right, let me put it this way. Different, uh, well, it, it all depends, because, you know, the... Mormons call themselves Christians. Yeah, I understand. All the witnesses yeah, you're right. Themselves Christians. You're right. So it all depends. Let on me put it mean. another way: if Chris, if if uh, if Jesus rose from the dead to show and prove that he was God, would you follow his teachings? Well, we don't have any models. If, if we don't have any models of anybody rising from the dead, of course not. Because if a lot of people were rising from the dead, the resurrection of Christ would mean nothing to us. No, the very I, fact that it is a rare event shows how special it is. No, I mean, babies are born every day. That's a, you know, I mean, does that mean that every time a baby's born, we, we're just like, oh, hey, we don't rejoice with people? Yes, we do. I mean, that would be great if we right, saw but you seem examples to be saying, of that. You seem to be saying, Javier, that it, you'd have to see a lot of resurrections to believe the resurrection of Christ. But, you know, it, it's, it's silly because we don't see any resurrection. That's any right. Resurrections. We don't see anybody rising from the dead. That's we right. We don't see anybody walking on water. If you did see that all the time, we would consider them some sort of natural event or natural phenomenon. The only reason miracles get our attention is because, against the backdrop of regular events, they're extremely rare. I mean, if people were popping up from the dead all the time, the resurrection of Christ would mean nothing. Not all the time. It would be nice to just see one. <laughs> There is one. Well, no. were you, were you there? That's the point. Were you there? How do you know? How do you know that he rose from the dead? There is eyewitness testimony. Were you there? there? Were you there? Has anybody in here ever seen anybody rise from the dead after three days? Anybody? How do you raise your hand? How do you? Has anyone seen George Washington? But George Washington doesn't tell us that if we don't believe in him, we go to hell. Again, the implications right? of George right. Washington. But it's a good point, though, right? It doesn't matter to me if George Washington was alive or not. I know it doesn't, doesn't matter to, to most of us. I mean, great, you know. So again, let me go back to my question. Go ahead. If it were true, would you follow the teachings of Jesus? Well, it all depends on your definition of truth. If truth, I gave you a truth, is that with, which corresponds to reality? Yes, you are correct. And people rising from the dead, I don't have any examples of that. I don't you have, do. No, I don't. I'm saying if, but we do. That's Jesus. Well, okay? we don't. I mean, a book says that it did, but we don't. 
We, we don't what know. evidence would you need to, to see to that'd say be, that it happened? That would be pretty presumptuous of me to, to say that. If Look, if God was real, he would know what it would take to convince me. Right? Unless you don't want to be convinced. Why wouldn't I? Why well, that's why I keep asking you, you the you, question you, and you keep you, saying, no, you, you keep say, dodging it. You, you say that this place is awesome and it's great and, you know, it'll be like this. Uh, the Bible says all these things. Why would I not want to go there? Good question. Why right? would I? If God, God would know what it would take to convince me. Now, there's a difference between belief that and belief in. Right. He can he can convince does, you belief that, but does, if you want to go to belief in, that's your choice. Does God, do, would God know what it would take to convince me that he was real? Oh, of course. Right. So why doesn't he do that? How do you know that uh, you are being completely honest with yourself? I know I'm completely honest. I'm I'm being completely honest. I'm not completely honest. Nobody well, here is completely well, honest. Well, just because you're not doesn't mean that I okay. just because you're not doesn't mean that I am. You know? Just like Ray Comfort has this thing where are you a liar? You know what? Look, how do I know? Look, how do I know? You take Peter, all these people that heard all these things and wrote all this down. God didn't write it. It was inspired, right? How do I know that they were not delusional? How do I know Moses didn't walk up and and find some mushrooms and he wrote these, well, mm -hmm. 21 mm -hmm. commandments or how? Because he broke the okay, first set. Okay, okay. Right? I, 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 I agree, Javier. We haven't covered that information here tonight. That's normally what I do, give evidence that Christianity is true. If you got two hours, I'd be happy to do the presentation. We could have but, lunch if you buy it. Yeah, that's right. You want to have lunch tomorrow? So Let's go have lunch. lunch. But I, if I give you a book, would you read it? I've seen you on a video do this. The girl said maybe. Yeah, she was in this room actually. Her name yeah. was Hannah. Yeah, I, yeah. Hannah, I remember Hannah. I, see, yeah. I saw the video, Hannah. Would you read it? Ah. Maybe. <laughs> Dave. I, I'd read it. I'd All right. Read it. It's I'd Dave's book. All right, let's talk some more. And if you want to go lunch tomorrow, we will. Are you going to be around? I'll be around. You All give right. me your number. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't leave. Don't leave. Yes, sir. What's your name? Hey, by the way, give a hand to Javier there. Yeah. What's your, what's your name, sir? Tydrick. Say again? Tydrick. Tydrick. Yes, sir. Go ahead. All right. Uh, Come so a little closer, too, to that mic. So my question kind of hinges on epistemology, uh -huh. kind of uh, like his question does. Yep. Now, I myself am a Christian, but oftentimes when I'm reaching out to people, uh, you know, I've come across many a person that uh, claim to be nihilist or immoralist for all the teachings of guys like Frederick Nietzsche and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so from that position, they take this idea of, like, I don't, I don't have any objective knowledge that good or evil exists or morality even exists. So if they refuse to acknowledge that there is good or evil, then, you know, arguing from a point of, you know, whether or not God or the idea that, I guess, evil then proves that there is an objective good, that kind of becomes uh, irrelevant because they don't believe in an evil or a good. They believe that all these things are just impressions that we gain from our experiences and stuff like that. So do you have a response for a person who would tell me that there is no objective good or evil and, you know, they remove that foundation by which to argue that there is God? Kick them in the shins and take their, their iPhone. Makes sense. <laughs> are they going to object? Are they going to think it's just a matter of opinion? Or are they going to say, that's really wrong. You shouldn't have done that. I think the... Well, I, I brought up things like that. Like if I poured a pot of boiling water on your head, would you think uh -huh. that's bad? And he'd be, well, their response would be, well, I'm a, my instinct is to survive. Therefore, biologically, I wouldn't like that. It's against my self-interest. But how does that prove good or evil? Well, is it evil to pour boiling water on someone's head? It will be against their... Uh, Just against their, their preference. Well, yeah. what they're saying is there's no ultimate good or evil. Here's the problem. You can't prove to somebody something they already know. They already know that torturing babies for fun is evil. They already know that. Jay Budzhevsky, who teaches at UT Austin, has written a book called What We Can't Not Know. And what he says to people who say... Oh, I don't really believe in murder, that murder's wrong. Jace used to say, look, I used to try and convince him that was murder, murder was wrong. He finally said, look, I, I just said, oh, you don't have any real doubt that murder's wrong, do you? Really? There's nothing I can do to prove to you that murder's wrong unless I prove to you that beyond a reasonable doubt that the scriptures are true and the scripture says don't murder. You already know through the moral law written on your heart that it's wrong. Okay? The people who say these kind of things will say them, but as soon as you do something wrong to them, they're going to react against it, and they're going to, in their hearts, know what you just did to them was wrong. 
So I, I hate to be flippant about these things, but if people say that say torturing babies for fun isn't wrong, all I can say to them is get help. <laughs> because that's really the truth of the matter. Everybody knows. Sacrificing children on, the, on Molex arms, which is what the Canaanites were doing, this molten hot god that they used to heat up and then watch their children sizzle, that's evil. Tearing a baby out of a womb and cutting her up in a partial birth abortion yeah. is evil. Um, molesting a four-year-old girl is evil. It is. And I don't, need to, I don't need to give you any evidence. In fact, any evidence for atheism is built on weaker premises than the moral intuitions we already have that torturing babies for fun is wrong, that sexually molesting children is wrong, that tearing babies apart is wrong. They already know that. They're just denying it so they don't have to face the consequences of it. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir, what's your name? Uh, Mylon. Hey, Mylon, how you doing? Doing well, thank you. Good. Um, I'm a Christian, so I, I watch a lot of videos, so I agree with you with pretty much everything, so don't get me wrong when I ask Wait, you. Would something. you call my wife? <laughs> and, and tell her to agree with me on just about everything. <laughs> that would be very helpful, Mylon. <laughs> All right? That would be really helpful. Okay. So my basic question is, God gave us the Bible. That's his perfect word. And so my question is, why can't us Christians agree? Uh, David Silverman, I saw that debate. He um, made the statement there's more uh, denominations of Christianity than there are uh, sentences in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So just to give a few, like homosexuality is a big one mm -hmm. nowadays. Um, and if you look in the past, women's rights, we debate mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. Religious wars, the Crusades, mm -hmm. or slavery. And why um, can't we agree on these topics? And a follow-up is, I agree with you, I said that, but why are you right in what you believe? Well, I may be wrong on some of the things I believe. But to be a Christian, you don't have to agree on every issue. In fact, Paul talks about believing in the resurrection to be saved. He talks about this in Romans chapter 10. Uh, and I think all these denominations that believe in the Bible, in fact, a friend of mine who's a, a, a pastor in Charlotte says, I don't even call myself an evangelical because that doesn't mean anything to most people. What I call myself is a biblical Christian, that I believe that the Bible interpreted at face value, um, taking into account that there are different kinds of literature in there and you have to take different kinds of literature uh, a certain way, differently. I believe what the Bible says. Okay, now denominations that believe the Bible is true differ on secondary or tertiary issues: mode of baptism, liturgy, or more free-flowing style, different types of music. I all I think all that's good, by the way. Why? Because people worship in different ways. Different personalities like different kinds of worship services. So that's fine. That's actually a good thing. But there are groups out there who call themselves Christians who don't even believe the Bible's true. You know, they're nothing more than hymns singing rotary clubs. Well, why? Why would you even go to, why would you just sleep in on Sunday? I mean, if you think there's no God or the Bible isn't true, you're just there for social reasons. You're not really there to worship God. You're there to talk to your, your neighbor. Well, you can do that any other day. So I actually think denominations by... And in a large part are, are good because they, they agree on the essentials, but they disagree on many of the non-essentials. Now, all these other issues that have been issues that have been controversies over the years, um, again, these are not salvific issues, but they're issues that there are disagreement on. And I think if you take a fair look at the scriptures on just about every issue you mentioned, uh, you can get vast agreement across most biblical Christians. Yeah, there may be some people who disagree on certain areas, but on the major issues, we all agree. So I think there is unity in the body. But there, is a lot of, there are a lot of people out there who claim to be Christians who really don't even believe the Bible, don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. Well, what's, what's the point? So along with that, um, so do you find it important? Well, I, I know your view on this, but I'm going to ask it anyway for mm -hmm. those who haven't heard it. Um, <laughs> uh, so you find it important that we enforce the views like homosexuality that I think the Bible is very clear on. It's important that we advocate in our country today what the Bible 
Are you asking a political question or a question within the church? Because they're two different questions. I think the church is most important. So yeah, the that. church, I think, for the good of everybody, has to stand against sexual immorality of any kind. And sexual immorality, uh, people say, well, Jesus never spoke against uh, homosexuality. Well, actually, that's not true. Whenever he used the phrase sexual immorality, he meant any kind of sex outside of a man-woman marriage. That included homosexuality as well as bestiality, as well as adultery, as well as premarital sex, any kind of sexual contact outside of marriage between a man and a woman. Now, is that for God's benefit? No, it's for our benefit. It's for our, God doesn't put rules into place for, our, for his benefit. He doesn't get anything else out of us obeying him. He's an infinite being. You can't improve him. You can't degrade him. It's we that get the benefit out of it. Now, let me just mention, instead of just looking at homosexuality, let's, let's just look for a second at sex in general. Because the culture is trying to tell us that sex is just physical. Sex is not just physical. If it was just physical, why is it worse if somebody rapes you than if somebody just physically assaults you? You see, sex is not just physical, it's also moral, it's also psychological, it's emotional, it's spiritual. There are so many aspects that come together when you have sex with someone. And by the way, we all know this, if you have sex with somebody, everything changes. Everything changes. It's not just a physical relationship. Now, pastors are supposed to shepherd their flock, and the shepherds warn of wolves coming in after the sheep. And shepherds know that when something as powerful of sex as sex is misused, their sheep are going to get hurt. And so they have to stand in the gap and say, don't do this. In fact, Paul says, flee sexual immorality. He's not just talking about homosexuality. He's talking about any sex outside of marriage. Why? Because it's so dangerous. Sex is like fire. If you put it in your fireplace, it'll warm you. If you get it anywhere else in your house, it will burn your house down. And what's going on in our country right now, there's a new religion. If you want to ask the political question, the political question is this. The new religion is the religion of sex. If you notice, just about everything we argue over politically on the social issues, all related to sex. Abortion, same-sex marriage, the government paying for abortion, the government paying for contraception. What bathrooms are we going to use now? What? This is, this is amazing that we're talking about this, if you think about this. All of these issues are related to sex. And the problem is, is that our friends on the other side of some of these issues, and maybe some of them are here in the room, that's fine. That is their ultimate. And they will hurt people who disagree with them. I know I've been hurt personally by this. I was actually fired from both Cisco and Bank of America for writing a book called Correct Not Politically Correct, How Same-Sex Marriage Hurts Everyone. Now, if they don't want to hire me, I never talked about the book. They just went online and learned I'd written it, and they fired me. They don't want to, if they don't want to hire me or they want to fire me, that's fine. But don't go around telling people you're inclusive and diverse because you're not. You're excluding people who have a diverse view. Yeah, thank you. Michael. Sir, hey, is that a Bible? It is a Bible. Do you believe that thing? I do. <laughs> Give it to Javier. <laughs> Rachel's saying yes. Look at Rachel. She's going, yeah. Yeah, give him that Bible. All right. Go ahead, Michael. So anyway, um, growing up a Christian, one of the first things that you're taught about God is that he loves everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is actually... He even loves Javier. Yep. Yeah. He does. So my question is pretty simple. <laughs> my question is pretty simple, but um, the question is, does God love everyone? And I have a couple of scriptures that, um, you know, is that I bring up that why I asked that question. So okay, yeah. Do you yeah, mind if I read them? They're just real sure. short. Yeah, go ahead. Where, where are they, by the way? Yeah, sure. Uh, the first one's Psalm chapter 5, verse 5. It's a psalm of David. Man, after is it an imprecatory psalm? Is it what? Imprecatory psalm. Where where David is asking God to judge his enemies? Um, it might be. Here's one thing. My friend Greg Kopel, you guys heard of Greg Kopel? Uh, wrote the book Tactics. He says this, never read a Bible verse. Why? The context. You need the context. We might have to read all of Psalm 5 to figure this out. But go ahead. What do you got? So anyway, I could read all Psalm 5, but I don't know if everyone wants me to do that. No, that's all right. Go ahead. What, just question? give me the verse. Okay, yeah. verse 5. It says, the arrogant cannot stand in your presence. 
you hate all who do wrong. Mm -hmm. The second mm -hmm. one is Psalm chapter 11, verse 5, um, which says, The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the third one is John chapter 14, uh, verse 21. Mm -hmm. If I can turn to this. Um, which says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Okay, let's deal with the John passage first. I'd have to read more around it, but let's just assume at face value it means what you say there. Obviously, God will love people who love him in the sense that in eternity, they will be the object of God's love. But if they're separated from God, how can they be the object of God's love? They can't be. Unless it means God's judgment. Uh, because God has withdrawn himself, his love from them, as I mentioned earlier. Now, the two psalm passages, well, I'd have to look at in more detail. Uh, but remember, psalms are poems. And the word, there's a lot of, of uh, examples in what is called ancient Near Eastern literature for hyperbole, right? If I say, I hate you, look. I mean, we say this to our parents sometimes when we're kids, right? I hate you. What do we really hate? It's emotion. We hate what they think, what we think they're doing to us, okay? But we don't really hate them. It's just a strong way of saying I disagree with what you're doing to me. And that could be what God's saying right there, okay? That God hates what these people are doing. And by extension, uh, he uses that hyperbole. But... You have to always interpret these scriptures in light of the other scriptures where God says he loved the whole world, right? He loves the whole world. He loves everyone. So just because you may find something in a poem that appears to be maybe hyperbole doesn't mean it literally means that God hates them because they're made in his image. So to hate them would be to hate himself. They're made in his image. So he loves them. He doesn't love what they do. Right. Anything Thank else? No, that's it. By the way, there is a great book that deals with some of these issues. It's called The Big Book of Bible Difficulties. It's written by my co-author, Dr. Norman Geisler, and his uh, another seminary professor called Thomas Howe. It used to be called When Critics Ask. You can get it, I think, maybe even on Kindle. Very good book for these kinds of questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Jamie. Yes, sir. Go ahead. First, I want to say you did an amazing, you put on a clinic when it had to do with technology. Oh. As a pastor, my sound system uh -huh. is deemed possessed. It is. And, okay. And, I told you there was evil. And I want to strangle it all the time, mm -hmm. but I just want to say you did a really nice job keeping your cool. And not, oh, I mean, I know you do this a lot, but still, when you're having technical difficulties... Um, it's very difficult. Thanks for the compliment, but when my our brethren are being hunted down by ISIS, I don't think sound issues is a big deal, <laughs> right? Um, and Christopher will fix it for tomorrow, right? He's he's on it, man. Thanks. All right. He's a junior from Dayton. Give him a hand over there for helping us out. Right there. So yeah. uh, my question is, as a pastor, um, I find that apologetics is 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 not a big thing in the church even when i try to make it a big thing yes uh and if you would just um maybe embellish a little bit on on maybe some approaches some ways that we could bring in apologetics to not just atheists but to christians and show them how important it really is well one of the best ways you can do it first of all sometimes things don't become important until they become personal every think about this if if you're a parent and your kid gets cancer, you suddenly become an expert on cancer. You didn't care about cancer before that, right? But when your kid gets cancer, you suddenly become an expert. Well, the same thing is true in apologetics. Once uh, one of their kids goes off to college and phones home and says, I don't believe in God anymore, then suddenly they want apologetics and they become experts. So part of it can just be warning them about what's coming down the road. The other thing to do is, uh, friends of mine like uh, Brett Kunkel and, and uh, Sean McDowell sometimes go to churches and, and play an atheist. They'll be an intelligent atheist. Like, I don't know if you're an atheist out of here, but, you know. I don't label myself. Okay, but you, 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 you come with counter arguments and you challenge the, the church or the Christian audience 
and you start throwing out objections, and you realize most of them have, they have no idea how to answer it. And you know what? You know what happens more than not? They'll start treating the atheist unkindly, and then that's the. Why I don't <laughs> That's why, okay, right. That's good, Javier, don't do that. Because those Christians are going to come after you. Those evil Christians. But anyway, yeah, they'll, they'll treat the guy unkindly, and then once he reveals I'm a Christian, they go, and he'll say to them, how did you treat me? Oh, gee, not very well. Because they get emotional because they don't have the answers to these questions. And by the way, one other thing before we go here, last thing. Don't, particularly with youth, don't train or, or don't teach youth, train them. In other words, if you just throw a whole bunch of information at them and say, hey, you need to know this, and then there's never a test, there's never an application, they don't care. But if you say, look, we're going to Ohio State in April, and we're going to ask some atheists to present to us their arguments as to why Christianity is false. And we're also going to go out on the quad here, and we're going to uh, do a survey and get into conversation with students and answer their questions. We better be ready, or if we're not ready, we're all going to be embarrassed. Then they're ready. It's like fighters, right? They get out of shape between fights, but once they know there's a fight, they're training. Because they know that bout's coming up, and they don't want to be embarrassed. So... Do events like visit college campuses. In fact, if you want to know how to do that, go to str.org and look up Brett Kunkel. He takes students to Berkeley every year, and Jim Wallace does too, and so does uh, Sean McDowell. And the, it's, it's some of the greatest trips they have because the kids get all fueled up, they get all trained, and then they go actually interact with people, and they, it's exhilarating, and they learn. Great. So don't just teach them, train them. Thanks. All right? All right, folks. Um, who can come back tomorrow night? We'll talk about science and bring your friends. Do we have a, a score update? Is it? Are we out of the first inning yet? <laughs> Nobody wants to know. Who's up? Seven. 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 It's seven to one. Uh, Why well, you get another game? <laughs> I don't, want another game. <laughs> don't you guys believe in miracles?